introduction will give you on me. <laughs> um, I, I am happy to see so many people here tonight. Uh, I really thought with the weather and the wind and the dark that uh, we might not have as many people here tonight. So thank you very much for coming. I'm sure the spaghetti helped. <laughs> So uh, what am I going to talk about tonight? Oh, um, Laura, do you have a pointer? Mm, if you don't, I can use my finger. Um, we're going to talk about hot water. We're all in it together. Next slide, please. Oh, and I don't mean a hot tub. I don't mean hot water for relaxation. I don't mean hot water for tea. I mean hot water in global warming. <clears throat> uh, the next few slides will give you equivalent phrases to global warming. So global warming equals global change. Global change equals climate change. And climate change equals climate variability. So you'll hear me use these phrases interchangeably uh, as I talk tonight. Uh, I just want to make sure that we were all on the same page. Next, Jean. So um, I describe this presentation as uh, one on climate change and variability, um, the effects on our marine environment and all the things that live in the marine environment, plus as an added extra um, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk about ch climate change solutions tonight because I think so many presentations talk about the effects and the consequences and the dire circumstances, but nobody ever tells you what to do. So hopefully we'll get to that tonight. Uh, I suspect some of you know Cliff Mass. He's a, a climatologist, a meteorologist at uh, the University of Washington. And he predicts that um, changes in the Pacific Northwest uh, with changing climate will be, uh, will be drier here and will be warmer here. Now I don't want you to confuse climate with weather. Do you know the difference between weather and climate? Weather is short term, climate is long term. So the difference between weather and climate is time. <clears throat> um, weather is basically the way uh, the atmosphere affects us, um, how it affects our lives, how it affects the environment around us. Um, it includes things like uh, sunshine, rain, cloud cover, winds, hail, ice storms, sleet, freezing rain, flooding, mudslides, um, thunderstorms, steady rays from a cold front, that kind of thing. Also excessive heat, um, heat stress. So in most places, weather can change from minute to minute, um, from day to day or from month to month. Whereas climate, climate is the average of weather over time and space. So when we talk about climate change, we talk about long-term trends, really, um, changes and variations, uh, things like um, average temperature rise over a period of 30 years, or uh, variations that come uh, periodically, like El Nino. So uh, the difference then, uh, simply put, between uh, climate and weather is climate is what you expect, and weather is what you get. Um, Long-term trends, these are climate trends over time. Uh, in the upper, your left, uh, climate trends over time, air mean temperature is rising. Upper, your right, uh, cumulative mean thickness of sea ice is declining. Um, and then on the bottom, oh, thank you so much, sea ice. Temperature is rising, sea ice declining, and then this is just worldwide uh, temperature, mean temperatures of both landmass and oceans. So these are the five essentials all living things need um, to survive. Air, water, food, shelter, and health. I'm going to briefly mention each of these because uh, I want you to think about them uh, with regards to climate change uh, as we go through this presentation tonight. Because truly, um, each of these essentials will be affected, uh, and so will survival of uh, living things. 
uh, by climate change. So air. With climate change and variability, we're seeing increased dust storms. This is a NASA photo of uh, Africa, a dust storm coming from Africa towards the southeast United States and Caribbean. Dust storms in the southwest United States, <coughs> and then uh, catastrophic wildfires. Uh, all these things uh, have an effect on the air we breathe. Um, so changes in climate bring with it changes in what we breathe in. Now this is a little busy slide, but I want you to have an understanding of what greenhouse gases are. Uh, greenhouse gas is a phrase you'll hear uh, regularly uh, when someone's talking about climate change. And it really relates to the various gases that humans, through their activities, through our activities, put into the air, particularly carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Uh, the sun's rays also um, do the same thing, but what we do is we heat up the surface with greenhouse gases and the sun's rays. Um, it is carbon emissions uh, that are uh, heating up the surfaces, uh, uh, particularly oceans. Next. Ocean acidification is one of the consequences of greenhouse gas buildup. The oceans and deep water systems, so uh, when I talk about things uh, happening in the oceans tonight, you can also think about things like the Great Lakes, because freshwater systems are being equally affected. Uh, but the oceans and deep water systems absorb about 80% of the greenhouse gases. They're, they're real uh, eaters of uh, greenhouse gases. In so doing, a chemical process takes place that produces more acidic waters. So the air with lots of carbon dioxide comes and it sits over the water and there's mixing because of wind or whatever. And uh, when that carbon dioxide gets into the waters, the waters become more acidic through a chain reaction, a chemical reaction. Lowers the pH, it lowers the uh, acidity of the water, it makes it very acidic, corrosive in some cases. Uh, and that inhibits the formation of a, a compound called calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate is what is needed for reef and shellfish formation. It's like the skeleton builder for most uh, marine organisms. Next team. So, definitely um, climate change is going to be affecting water, uh, not only in the way I just described, but also in water quality and quantity. Um, 90%, 97% of the salt water, 97% of the water on the earth is salt water. 3% is fresh water. All the fresh water on the planet that we will ever have is here today and will never change. So we have to protect it. So only 3% of the planet's water. And the ma majority of that fresh water is uh, in ice sheets, uh, in um, glaciers, in snowpack, in the Arctic, the Antarctic, and the uh, Greenland ice sheet. So uh, water quality and quantity is very important for us to think about and what's going to be happening to it in a changing climate. So uh, these are some long-term trends um, with the changing climate in ocean systems. There's going to be, there already is, increased wave intensity, especially if you've seen the high, high seas this month, have you? Um, increased wave intensity, um, the waves churn up the sea, so the nutrients are uh, turned over. Uh, nutrients that normally aren't churned that deep are brought closer to the surface. So um, there's a change in the food web. Uh, the food nutrients are not in the water column where they normally are. They're changing their position in the depth of the ocean or toward the surface of the ocean, depending on what nutrient it is. Okay. So definitely there's effect on food. Um, I saw an eagle doing this today on my way over, only he was carrying, I don't know how he got it, a rockfish that was about this big. And he was swimming in the water because it was too heavy to carry. <laughs> so, um, and he swam a half a mile like that. Uh, so the nutrients and the quality and quantity of food are going to be very important. So think about food availability and food quality as we talk about specific climate, climate effects when we go into the specifics of species. Next. 
So I've talked about the food web, and uh, this is just a sort of tacky, uh, modified graphic of what the food web is. Um, I'll use this phrase a lot, and uh, so do most people who talk about ocean resources. Um, it involves forests, birds, cities, people, industries, fish, whales, plankton. Um, you'll hear more about this as we go on. Shelter. How will climate change alter marine and freshwater ecosystems and the uh, life that they support? Things like uh, marshes, uh, estuaries, tidal deltas, mangroves, they're all very, very important habitat types that will be affected by climate change. Uh, things like saltwater influx may happen, um, increased freshwater runoff with floods, uh, mudslides, sea level rise. Uh, these places could be drastically reduced and degraded uh, if we don't pay close attention to them. One example is juvenile salmon uh, coming down the Skagit River uh, must hide, rest, and grow in the Skagit River Delta wetlands before they go out to sea, before they're big enough to not be eaten by predators, and before they're strong enough to be able to swim in the ocean currents. So the delta areas, the wetland areas, are extremely important. So if they're changing with climate, we have to be worried about that. Jean? The uh, International Panel on Climate Change uh, used a series of, many series of models in 2007 to project that the sea level will rise, sea level rise, SLR, uh, one to one and a half feet by the year 2100. Unfortunately, a 2012 projection using similar models uh, and current data uh, show a rise of three feet by 2100, the year 2100. This is from the University of Colorado. So sea level rise will affect water, food, and shelter over the long term. And then health. Um, disease will also be a consequence of climate change. Um, Foodborne disease, uh, you know, oysters that you can't eat, oysters that um, sea otters can't eat. Um, vector reproduction, mosquitoes. The Canadian government reports uh, the uh, most mosquitoes carrying West Nile virus ever uh, this past summer. Uh, West Nile virus titers have also been found in marine mammals. Now, so we know mosquitoes are biting marine mammals when they come to the surface. Um, air quality is part of this uh, public health issue as well. Um, besides thermal acclimation, you know, the nights are staying warmer. They're not cooling down in most urban areas the way they used to, so there are thermal effects. But uh, the other effects are um, smog or uh, increased incidence of asthma from impaired air quality, from those things I mentioned before, like dust storms intensity of wildfires, that kind of thing. And then finally, um, with, the uh, with the depletion of the ozone layer that happens during climate change, there's more infrared, more ultraviolet radiation coming through. So the DNA in our skin is changing and there's an increased incident of skin cancer, as well as uh, DNA changes that are being found in many staple crops grown for food like uh, Wheat, soybeans, corn, and oh yes, hops and barley could be affected. <laughs> Very serious problem on the change of cause. Next, Jean. So let me get into some specifics. Um, I'm losing all my attachments here. Um, the ocean supports the life of uh, nearly 50% of all species on the Earth from the very largest to the very smallest. Um, and the ocean supplies, uh, and the organisms in it supply a significant percentage of the protein in our diets and in the diets of the other animals in the food web. So the smallest creatures in the ocean are plankton. They're microscopic. They can be plant and animal. And uh, the largest creatures on Earth, or the largest creature, is the blue whale, which is here. Um, the blue whale, uh, so microscopic and largest, the blue whale can weigh up to 330,000 pounds. It can be 88 to 108 feet long. 
And it's the size of about 23 bull elephants. So if you've ever seen a bull elephant, just add 22 more, and that's the size of a blue whale. So the biggest animals in the sea, the baleen whales, eat the smallest animals in the sea as their main food source. Well, what are some of the effects on, of climate change on plants, algae, and herbivores? Um, eelgrass. Well, the first thing you should know is, in general, um, with climate change, species on land are moving up in altitude, up mountains, and then toward the poles, toward the North Pole or toward the South Pole, away from the equator, essentially. So eelgrass, even eelgrass, is moving. And it's moving northward in the Chesapeake Bay to the point where uh, species that rely on the eelgrass for uh, safety, for shelter, and for food are, are having trouble finding the eelgrass. So that's one problem. Then there are harmful algal blooms that are occurring more regularly because the waters are warmer. So the algae, the harmful algae, have a tendency to grow more. Um, this is an algal bloom from space. Uh, and then these tiny little plankton, oh, and the manatee is um, uh, an herbivore. All it eats is veg vegetable matter, you know. So if it gets into some of these al algal or eelgrass areas, that are having problems, um, it has problems. We know the manatee is having trouble with respiratory and gastrointestinal problems because of climate change. And then finally, these little tiny plankton, just some other views of it, and there's a little pair of tweezers to let you see how tiny they are. Um, they have um, a carbonate skeleton just like other uh, sea animals do, and so they too are having trouble uh, creating their shells and protective uh, reproductive functions. Next. Um, going more into the effects on shellfish and coral, um, what we're seeing is crabs with thinning shells, oysters with thinning shells. I think you probably know some of the oyster companies here in Washington are moving elsewhere. Um, sea stars have a carbonate type uh, skeleton, uh, coral reefs, of course. And the coral reef uh, is even more important because not only is it a place for shelter, uh, for nurseries, and for um, safety, but it also protects the coastlines uh, from hurricanes, from uh, heavy waves, from winds. And so if the coral reefs are damaged, and they are living, coral reefs are living, uh, if they're damaged and they die, they lose that protective function. The effects of uh, climate change on fish populations, you need to think of a fish as a marine, water-breathing organism. But when it breathes in that water through its gills, what it's really trying to do is breathe in oxygen. It needs oxygen to survive. Um, if water temperature is higher, um, the oxygen carrying capacity of the water is damaged, so it can't carry as much oxygen. Or if the water is taking up too much carbon dioxide, there's not as enough room for all the oxygen that's normally there. So fish are having to um, work harder to get the oxygen they need. Um, there was a recent study uh, related to body weight. Uh, the journal Nature published an article recently about a model that looks at 600 different species of fish worldwide and the impact <coughs> of the changing climate on them. Uh, the biggest effect that the models are showing is that more than 50% of these 600 species of fish are dropping up to 24% of their body weight um, in the model. So uh, they're not getting enough food or oxygen or something, but whatever. There's a loss of body weight. And then um, increased exposure to disease. So when fish um, move or marine mammals move to a different location because the water uh, is cooler there, uh, it may be they'll run into novel disease agents, agents their bodies haven't seen before, agents that they don't have any uh, resistance to. And so there is an increased potential for uh, disease. And then just a, an example of uh, salmon and trout, uh, cold water fish are shifting toward the north. 
You know, they're moving away from the southern part of their ranges and moving toward the northern part of their ranges. Effects on seabirds. Seabirds nesting on land may have to fly farther to find food. So in the northern climes, uh, there's a, a fish called the Arctic cod that a lot of seabirds depend on. And the Arctic cod has a really interesting behavior. Um, it likes to um, avoid open water and live right under the edge of the ice shelf where it's safer. So the birds have learned to fly out to the edge of the ice, dive in, and find this Arctic cod right under the ice. But with a change in climate, with a loss of sea ice, um, the birds are having to fly farther, um, work harder, um, not find the amount of food they need, and then when they get back to their chicks, the nests have failed because they've been gone so long. So, um, Seabird nesting on land may have to fly farther to find food. Seasonality of nesting may be disrupted. Um, if the seasons are changing, again, the fish that are usually there might not be there, and the birds have to look elsewhere. And then finally, uh, changing conditions for birds may make environs more suitable for vectors and other disease agents. Lots and lots of West Nile virus in seabirds now as well as land birds. Next. This is the only graph I'm going to show you today, and not to bore you, but to show you the extent of Arctic ice loss over time. This is a climate trend, a 30-year climate trend, 1978 to 2008. And what I want to show you is the exponential drop uh, in the extent of Arctic ice, in the extent of square kilometers, a million square kilometers of Arctic ice, particularly in 2008. Before I go on to the next slide, which is a video, I'm going to set up that slide for you. It's a NASA video uh, taken from space of the Arctic Circle. I'll point out Alaska with my pointer so you see it. Along the horizontal um, base of the video is a time sequence, the last 30, uh, 30 years, 18, 18, 1980 to 2010. And uh, you'll see the ice change over time. Very white ice is thick, old, what we call permanent ice. It's not very permanent, you'll see. And then the lighter, bluer, thinner, uh, lighter, bluer ice is the thinner ice, the newer ice. Uh, not really what we like to see because it isn't as protective. Okay, Jean, go ahead. I'm gonna run the video three times. So here's time, here's Alaska, here's the Aleutians, here's Greenland. Watch 2008, there it is. same time of year. And what we are finding is uh, this is the data that's been analyzed for the last 30 years, but 2012 is worse than 2008. It just isn't in a video yet for me to show you. This summer was very, very bad. Next, Jean. So let me talk about a couple of Arctic species. Uh, walrus populations, 95% um, of walrus are in the seas in Alaska. Um, there are 400,000 walrus worldwide. They feed on the bottom. They like to uh, stir up clams and sea worms. So they have this pattern. Um, they dive down. They don't go very deep. They only go in waters 150 feet deep or less. And they dig around on the bottom. And they come up with their clams and their sea worms. They stay down there about seven minutes. And then they come up to the surface and they breathe for a, about two minutes. And then they go back out again and do it all over again. So, um, Next slide. What we're finding is that the female walrus and their pups are being affected by the ice loss. The females are having to travel farther uh, to find food. Um, they're having to haul out on shore instead of ice flows because the ice flows aren't there. 
Um, they have to stay out foraging longer before they can go back to their pups to feed them. So they leave their pups and they come back and feed them. So the pups are having significant mortality um, for three reasons. Physiologically, because they're not getting enough food. Physically, because there's more crowding. You can see how much crowding there is here. And because there's increased disturbance, because there's less ice, there's more transport vessels, more human activity, uh, more oil and gas exploration in the area, and so they're being disturbed more. This little yellow circle here is a pup, a walrus pup. If these animals are disturbed, and they're pretty jittery, um, they'll just run right over that pup and crush it on their exit to the sea. So, uh, you know, there's a very physical part to um, how the climate changing is changing activities that are affecting the walrus. Next year. Polar bears. Um, polar bears have been studied uh, in Alaska for uh, many years. Uh, we know over the last 30, uh, USGS has found, that's US Geological Survey, by the way, <laughs> has found uh, declines in body condition, uh, reduced survival rates in babies, and smaller numbers of dens. Um, and a 22% decline in polar bear population since 1987. When this calculation was done statistically in uh, where are we now? 2010, um, this statistic uh, was primarily based on changes in climate. Next year. So what's happening? Sea ice breakup is happening three weeks earlier in the Arctic. So it retreats more and it retreats more offshore. Um, the proportion of polar bears denning on sea ice has decreased versus those denning on land. Uh, so there's more interaction, human to polar bear. Um, polar bears use the ice flows to travel, to hunt seals from the ice flows. Um, they uh, hunt, they feed, they raise their young, and the ice is melting at an exponential rate. Okay. So I just show you this once more to demonstrate that we're all connected within the web of life. Um, we're all in this together. We're all connected, we'll all be affected, we'll all need to respond and adapt and act. Next team. Before I go on to solutions, I just wanted to talk very briefly about whether climate change is related to natural disasters. I would say for sure, droughts, wildfires, flooding, mudslides, avalanches, melting glaciers, ice sheets, and sea level rise are all climate related. Hurricanes and superstorms, well, maybe, maybe Governor Christie and uh, Mayor Bloomberg and Mr. Obama might think that superstorms are part of climate change now, but there really isn't a lot of evidence yet. Volcanic activity, the only connection I can tell you there is that when a volcano erupts, it sends out ash over the snow and ice. You know, a lot of volcanoes erupt in snow and ice areas of the Arctic. Uh, and when that happens, the snow and ice is darker, so it absorbs more heat, and the ice and snow melt more. So, not so good. Volcanic activity, like eruptions themselves and earthquakes themselves, I don't think there's any connection. At least there's no evidence for connection uh, to climate change at this time. Okay, Jean. Uh, just to give you an example of a, an indirect effect that a hurricane can have, on an ecosystem. Remember we talked about how important the mangrove forests are. This is um, uh, Big Cypress in Florida, and this is 2009 before and after Hurricane Andrew, the exact same location the picture is taken from. So you can see the complete loss of shelter habitat. Okay, Jean. So I like to say when I think of climate change, it makes my hair hurt. <laughs> because um, it's such a big thing. It affects everything. I think that's why my hair does hurt when I think about it, because it's so big. It's hard to get your arms around it. The perceptions are, as we look out at our relatively clear, clean air, or the gleaming ocean that would have been outside this window, or light out, um, the thought is that all is well. 
In reality, the problem is that we can't see climate change and variability due to its long-term, slow rate of change. And so we can't get our heads around it. It seems too big. But I want to give you some solutions tonight uh, that tell you how if we all work together to combat, adapt, and modify over time, I think we can affect um, changing climate. So uh, these are the types of solutions I'm going to talk to you about uh, first tonight. Um, Mother Nature. I have some funny stories about Mother Nature. Um, some international solutions, some national, state, and local solutions that you might be interested in, some corporate solutions, and then some individual solutions, things that I try to do every day, and I hope you will too. So we've all heard reduce, reuse, recycle. Seattle Recycling Program's motto is reduce, reuse, recycle, rethink. And I hope these solutions will help you rethink um, the fact that there are things that we can do together to combat climate change. Jean? So, I mentioned that sea otters and whales are going to be affected by climate change because the foods they eat will be having trouble forming skeletons. But uh, what I haven't told you is that these animals are also part of Mother Nature's solution to climate change. Uh, let me start with the sea otter. The sea otter lives in kelp forests, and the kelp forests are probably one of the finest examples of uh, uptake of carbon dioxide in the ocean. The sea urchin also lives in kelp forests, and they eat voraciously munch on kelp forests to the point of decimating them. When the sea otter is there, the sea otter <coughs> munches on sea urchins and it keeps the system in balance. So when the sea otter is there, the kelp forest is healthy. I just want to read you um, a little note here. Uh, researchers from the University of California, Santa Cruz, looked at 40 years of data on otters and kelp blooms in California, Washington, British Columbia, and Alaska. In areas where sea otters flourished, the density of kelp was much higher than areas without otters. In the absence of sea otters and in the presence of sea urchins, the kelp forests were becoming decimated. So this is all documented in the research that's been done over 40 years. Um, so sea otters are helping keep the kelp forests healthy. Now what's this down here? Well, this is one of the great whales. And this is another great whale here. Um, the great whales, in particular, um, a blue whale can eat four tons of food a day. Four tons of plankton a day, a blue whale eats. Now you can imagine that produces a lot of poop. So in this picture, there's a great whale. What do you think that is? That's a fecal plume, a plume of poop, almost as large as the whale itself. <laughs> and it's orange because the krill that this whale's been eating has an orange tinge to it. So um, the fecal material uh, plays a very important part in carbon sequestration. Believe it or not, fecal poop also can hold on to carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases and keep it from escaping and warming the air. So um, fecal poop is part of carbon sequestration. Next. So what's this word I keep using, this technical word, sequestration? Um, you'll hear it over and over when people are talking about solutions to uh, climate change and greenhouse gases. Um, it's an ability to hold on to or, uh, <coughs> greenhouse gases to keep the temperature from rising. So it's a storage unit or a holding area or a sequestration area. Um, there are three types of holding areas. The ocean sequestration, when the ocean picks up the carbon dioxide and holds onto it so it won't warm the air. Uh, the terrestrial or biological sequestration, kind of the sea otter and poop examples I just gave you, the kelp forest. Uh, the northwest forest, the Pacific Northwest forests actually hold on to more carbon dioxide than the tropical rainforests. And that's because the Pacific Northwest forests are longer lived trees the tropical rainforests are shorter-lived trees in a warmer climate. 
So the Pacific Northwest forest is extremely important. Um, and then finally, there's geologic sequestration. Now this is a forced sequestration where uh, the greenhouse gases are scrubbed by chemicals uh, or um, through more technical processes, they're uh, captured from exhaust uh, and then injected into geologic, porous geologic formations. So, um, you know, this is the third kind. We need to pay attention to support and support all forms of sequestration over the next 20 to 30 years to have an impact on the greenhouse gases that are associated with climate change. Next, Jean. So, healthy oceans, forests, and wetlands are part of Mother Nature's solutions for us. This is kind of a busy slide, but I wanted to um, tell you about some of the international solutions going on. Um, if we continue to burn fossil fuels without capturing greenhouse gases, the hot water we're in will just get hotter. Um, these solutions are kind of an insurance policy um, to keep us and the world from tipping over into that hot water. Accelerating global cooperation, uh, reducing per capita resource use globally, replacing fossil fuels with sustainable resources, Developing efficient food production and distribution systems to use less energy. Uh, protecting land and ocean habitats, so marine protected areas or conservation areas around the world. Um, following organizations like the UK's Climate Wise, I'm going to read you uh, a note about that in a moment. Supporting international treaties, you know Doha, Qatar just had uh, 200 countries gather there last week uh, to look at the 1997 Kyoto Protocol on Climate Change and to extend its uh, uh, suppression of greenhouse gases uh, for the next, through 2020. So, um, and then ensuring insurance companies and health organizations are working on solutions. So I'm gonna tell you about this one uh, company called ClimateWise. Uh, it's a global insurance industry leadership group and it drives action to change uh, it drives action on climate change risk. Um, the participants are from Asia, Europe, North America, and South Africa, and it's facilitated by the University of Cambridge's Program on Sustainable Leadership. Um, in the United States, the Prudential Insurance Company is uh, looking at climate policies uh, for their operations, and they're really looking at climate policies to affect the insurance uh, policies that we all hold. But really, that's the only company here in the United States that's doing anything major so far. So, prompt your insurance agents to think a little bit more about climate change. Jean? National, state, local solutions. So, it's important to urge your congressional and uh, state representatives to keep their eyes focused on climate change. It's hard for a congressional member to do that because they're Life changes every two years, and you know, their issues change every three years. And, but because it's a long-term issue, it's important to keep the focus, particularly on the people who understand the big picture. Um, you know, follow EPA and NOAA and USGS uh, and how, uh, urge them to study more about ocean acidification and the effects climate change is having on the oceans. Uh, support programs that restore ecosystems. Get involved in state and local planning efforts. I'm gonna tell you about three. The first is the Skagit Climate Science Consortium, SC squared. Skagit Climate Science Consortium, right up the road. Um, you know, they're a very uh, viable organization. They're working on uh, actions. Uh, they're a cooperative partnership, the University of Washington Climate Impacts Group, uh, USGS, Park Service, a whole bunch of folks are involved with it. So keep your eyes on that. Of course, the state of Washington last week, uh, last month, released their ocean acidification report. And if you haven't read it, I urge you to read it. Uh, uh, Governor Gregoire uh, pointed out that there's a lot of action that we all can do within that report. So I urge you to read it. If you need the website, I have it. And then finally, I'm gonna to talk to you uh, just briefly about the state of California's climate change website. It's a very, very fine website. It's called Climate Change, Just the Facts. Quote, climate change poses an 
immediate and growing threat to California's economy, environment, and public health. The state is taking action to prepare for the unavoidable impacts of climate change, including the increased likelihood of both flooding and drought. The fact is that on key issues, the science is clear. Climate change is real and happening now. Human-made greenhouse gas emissions are affecting our planet, and we need to take action. Just as we reached a point where we stopped debating whether cigarette smoke causes cancer, we need to end the climate change debate and focus on how to solve the problems. The state of California has compiled facts about climate science, expert opinions, expert consensus, and some of the common arguments for and against a changing climate. So I urge you to take a look at climate change, just the facts. Next, three very quick examples of corporate solutions. Uh, Subaru has a zero landfill program. Uh, it is uh, based in their uh, Indiana plant. Uh, it's been ongoing since 2004. That means zero waste. Everything that's produced in their factory, all the cars that are produced in their factory in this Indiana plant produce no waste. Everything that's produced is either recycled or reused. So the Subaru plant in Indiana produces less garbage than you and I do in one day. Um, DuPont, DuPont Chemical. DuPont Chemical has a Going Green initiative, um, and they've had it since the 1990s. I met their futurist who was in charge of zero waste at DuPont, and their um, zero, their Going Green initiative, um, let's see here, they reduce, re use, recycle, um, they have a program uh, that they've been working on since the 1990s. They give rebates to employees who buy energy efficient uh, laundry appliances, they teach organic gardening and using green um, waste. Uh, they're taking on management of a number of parks in the cities uh, that their plants are located in. Uh, they have alternative energy and they have public education programs. And then finally, bush beans. Now, I don't mean bush beans make methane. <laughs> Although I don't know about you, they sure do with me. <laughs> um, bush beans is a very uh, bush, what are they called? Uh, their actual name is Bush Brothers and Company. Um, bush Brothers and Company have uh, formed an alliance with uh, two energy companies, a dairy cooperative and a, the Eau Claire Energy um, and Power Company in Wisconsin. And what they're doing is they're collecting uh, all the methane product produced during the fermentation of the beans and producing energy for a community of 500 people uh, just through the bean fermentation methods. It's an anaerobic process. It has no odor associated with it at all. So, you know, maybe people aren't farting anymore there either. I don't know. <laughs> and then in uh, the Bush Bean Plant in Sevierville, Tennessee, which is their main plant, the uh, plant actually has a dairy herd, and the dairy herd methane produces all the energy needed to make that uh, factory function to produce bush beans. So eat bush beans. <laughs> so individual solutions. Um, what are individual solutions? Really, it's important to continue to increase your awareness and to increase your neighbor's awareness of what's going on. Recycle, I know that sounds like a simple thing to do, but it's really easy to do, so try to do it. Um, I play a game with myself. I try to recycle five times more a week uh, than I put out in garbage. So. Um, walk or bike instead of driving. Consider buying an energy efficient car. Take the train instead of a plane. Uh, compost or grow red worms. Um, for about 20 years, my husband and I composted and grew red worms. We live in a condo now, so we can't do that anymore. Kohler even makes a sink that you can, uh, that has a sealable container for composting within your kitchen instead of a disposal. Um, plant trees to help carbon sequestration. And then, I don't know about you, but this time of year, I get more catalogs and junk mail than I've ever seen. So last week, I went on to catalogchoice.org it took me about 15 minutes and I canceled 27 catalogs that I never could look at. 
You need to have them in front of you because it has the numbers on it. And some of them even allow you, if you have some special catalogs that you really like, like LL Bean, you can get it a couple times a year instead of once a week, which is what I've been getting lately. So reduce, reuse, recycle, rethink. If everybody on the planet, and there are 7 billion of us on this planet, did one little thing a day, we would be way better off. Gene? So pledge to take one action per month to reduce your own carbon footprint, and we'll get out of this hot water. Next, Gene. So we still have a lot to discover about the effects of climate change on aquatic and marine systems. And I hope this presentation has helped you become more aware of uh, some of the things that are happening with regard to climate change and variability. And I hope it's made you realize that everything is connected. And by the way, that's a view from my condo, so the ocean is pretty important to me. Gene? Uh, these are some major sources I use to prepare the presentation. The Northwest Climate Science Center is at the University of Washington and Oregon State University. It's a public-private partnership. The University of Washington Climate Impacts Group is part of it. I also already mentioned climate, Skagit Climate Science Consortium. There's a climate change collaborative. Science News is really great on keeping yourself up to date on uh, climate science. The Oregon Climate Change Research Institute, the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium for Climate and Health, and Yale Climate Change Forum. Next, Gene. And thanks to the CDOC Society for having me tonight. It's been wonderful to be here. And these are some of the entities that I worked with to uh, get my information for the talk. Gene? <laughs> so, who? <laughs> Yoda says who? So thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for being part of the solution. Thanks a lot. Could I just add one individual solution that a lot of people, of uh, what well, we're all of a certain age, or most of us anyway, uh, when we were growing up, we learned that when you uh, turn on a car in cold weather, you need to warm it up and leave it idling. And, and I still see people idling their vehicles today. If you talk to mechanics who know about engines and cars, you don't need to warm cars up anymore. And so if you're, if you're going to stop somewhere and you're going to be there longer than 10 seconds, Turn off your vehicle. It'll start right up when you get back there. And it can save a lot of gasoline and save a lot of air pollution. Yes. I want to ask you about the, the harvesting of krill that is being done now. The harvesting of krill for omegas. Can you speak address this? Is it a problem? What effect that might have? I cannot speak to that. But when I think of the, um, you know, the fact that the whales are increasing in number, thank God. Um, and the amount of food that the baleen whales eat, not the toothed whales, but the baleen whales, the harvesting of krill, I suppose if it's done in a, an aquaculture kind of situation, might be all right, but uh, I really can't speak to it. It isn't anything that I've investigated at all. Um, I have to say I take fish oil, but uh, not, I don't believe it's krill fish oil. So. Yeah. Actually, the uh, <coughs> volcanoes uh, actually work against the uh, warming, so if you could find a way to have more volcanoes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Actually, but it's only short term that it works. But, but also, uh, you didn't mention that with, with the warming, both on land and in the ocean, there's a, just mountains of, of uh, frozen methane uh, that may at some point reach right. the point where, it, where it's no longer frozen and, and it will swap. Right, so one of the best um, methane sequestration uh, methodologies is the methane hidden under the Antarctic ice shelf. And uh, if that ice shelf were to melt, uh, that methane would be released and there would be more um, greenhouse gases in the air. So the trick is to have Mother Nature not work against us.
exact temperature. What they have determined is a point beyond which the temperature cannot rise without having major effects if we don't act. So there are a lot of uh, intercorrelations, I guess, in their determinations. So they haven't given us uh, an exact number. But if it's colder than it is now or warmer than it is now? I'm sorry. Do we know if it's colder than it is now or warmer than it is now? It's, it is, the number that they've given us is warmer than it is now, but not much warmer. And with the exponential rise, they're worried that it's going to get away from us before we act. I see. Okay. But I don't have that specific number, so. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was wondering, what is the effects of our local area, the weathers, uh, the, our conditions in life, of what's going to happen over the next weather projection you can go? Well, one thing I can tell you is the IPCC models, the International Panel on Climate Change Models, are for more uh, regional and national models. They're not really localized models. And so if you're really interested in what's going to happen right here, right now, I would get involved with the Climate Impacts Group at the University of Washington because they do their predictions locally. They take the IPCC models and they um, downscale them to what's happening locally here. So. Um, Every place is different. I mean, it is climate variability. Some places are going to be colder, but some places are going to be much warmer. So um, the, the only predictions we have, uh, the general predictions for the Pacific Northwest are the two that I gave you at the very beginning that Cliff Massas uh, promoted. I had one other question, that was, what have you been doing, since you have all this knowledge and you're, you're in touch with what's going on, what have you been doing to make changes? Well, I, I recycle like crazy. I, um, I went to the car show two weeks ago with my husband and we looked at uh, the Chevy Volt, which gets 265 miles per gallon. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so we've been looking at uh, other ways that we don't drive much at all. I take public transportation on a bike or a walk. Um, I take the train a lot. Uh, I do uh, sign up for uh, carbon credits if I fly just makes me feel better. Somebody's planting a tree for every time I take a plane. Um, like I said, we had red worms and that ate our garbage. They're really fun. You can hear them popping. <laughs> <laughs> and they ate all our garbage. We had a lot of garbage. Um, and schools could do that, for instance. You know, you could, uh, a camp like this could have red worms compost uh, all their waste materials. Um, what else am I doing? Uh, I try not to have synthetic clothing. I, um, I read something last week where uh, the fibers from uh, polypropylene clothing, I have long underwear that's polypropylene, um, have been found in large numbers in gyres in the ocean because it's a, a synthetic compound. It isn't dissolving. It isn't being taken care of by Mother Nature, because it's synthetic. So uh, those are just some of the things. Uh, I always try to think, uh, uh, when I go to throw something away, I try to think uh, about whether I can reuse it or not. And when I go to the grocery store, I buy a product based on how it's packaged. We once did a demonstration in Washington, D.C., where we went to a Safeway and we bought Four of us bought $10 worth each of food, and we went outside the front of the store, and we unpacked everything and looked at pile like this high in front of the store. They changed their packaging. Uh -huh. Yes? Same with the Levi's that you buy. They're leached. Those are using lots of COVID. Leached Levi's aren't so good, huh? <coughs> they sure are in style, aren't they? <laughs> yeah? For the last few years, the county has spent a lot of energy uh, worrying about uh, the impact that we have locally on the marine environment. Um, and yet I look at it and, and I have a hard time seeing that what we do locally is going to really be very significant compared to what's going to happen, what kind of havoc is going to be wreaked by global warming. What are your thoughts? Well, I really think everybody has to do something individually to make this work. You know, otherwise, it's us saying, oh, it's 
so big, let the government worry about it. Okay, but I, I don't mean the, what we can do about global warming. I, I mean worrying about uh, what we might be doing uh, in terms of runoff of our stuff, stuff we might put on the lawn if we have one. Um, things, things like that, really, you know, very site-specific things. Well, I think compared to what the global warming is, is I think it's, I think the actions, whether they're positive or negative, that we do are cumulative. So if we accumulate good actions, like not putting fertilizer into the water, I think the whales are doing a good enough job with that. Um, <laughs> If we accumulate good things, I think we'll help the climate. If we accumulate bad things, we'll damage the climate. And if you do it, and the 60 or 70 other people in this room do it, because, you know, it really doesn't make much of a difference. I think that that's the attitude that's causing us not to get anywhere with greenhouse gas emission reductions. I, I know that sounds very bureaucratic, but to me, er everything I do relates to how I can help overcome the changes in the climate. And if you're, if you're not helping me, or your county isn't helping me, it's a losing battle. And I don't want it to be a losing battle, because I know it can be a winning battle if we all do it together. Recently, we've heard a lot in our area about a proposed uh, coal shipping facility that would ship. <coughs> there's a lot of money to be made shipping U.S. coal to China to burn. What kinds of impacts do you, you know, so they've talked all kinds of numbers, but you know, 400 more ships per year, each one 400 feet long or yards long, or those big guys. Well, I can't speak specifically to coal, but I can speak specifically to China and India. Uh, they aren't part of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, they aren't considered developed nations, which is what the Kyoto Protocol speaks to, and yet they're uh, producing much more greenhouse gas uh, than they used to because they're industrialized. So for us to send coal to China, to me, is unethical. Just my personal opinion as a scientist. Um, economically, I mean, if you look at the Subaru example, they are making a gazillion dollars because they have no waste. And, if, and they have many more jobs to offer to people because they're building more cars. So if you can turn that sort of cost-benefit analysis around, I, I heard a guy on the uh, CNN yesterday talking about uh, he was talking about economic growth and how important it was for everyone to have many more children so that we could have economic growth. You know, so <laughs> I turned to my husband and said, "Why isn't someone refuting that?" He said, "Well, they just give the facts here." I said, oh, not a good <laughs> So I, I can't really answer, but I, you know, I think it's unpopular. <laughs> I think if the insurance agencies and the health agencies get involved in this climate change planning, perhaps the economics will turn around. You know, maybe Sandy will be a wake-up call. I don't know. Yeah, one more thing. We, we all have an opportunity to participate in helping stop the, the Cherry Point coal terminal. January 21st is a really important deadline. Between now and January 21st, we all have the opportunity to send in comments. Um, and if you will go to Orca Snow Coalition, we have a great website that we started here on Orcas to fight this Cherry Point Coal Terminal. And uh, it will tell you how to write these scoping comments. And we will be having a workshop, actually, if you want to do it in a group. And we'll, we'll announce it on that website also. But um, really, really important. You can write as many comments as you want about as many topics that come to you that you want to ask them to look into.
before they they allow this project to go forward. So we're trying to stop we're trying to stop this project from being able to be built at Church Point. Um, website again. Or it's no coalition. And off yet. So I have three little presents tonight for some of the best questions. <laughs> Remember, hops and barley. <laughs>